I want to teach tonight for the next little bit on the topic, the heart of the hypocrite. The heart of the hypocrite. Let's look, verse 37. And he spoke a certain Pharisee, and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make also the inside? But rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Then one of the lawyers answered and said unto him, Teacher, by what saying these things you reproach us also? The lawyers were the people who transcribed the law. Woe to you also, scribes or lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you, find, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you! For you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation." From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Mm, Got to teach. You did not enter into yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. Father, bless us tonight with your word. Give us hearts to hear, hearts to understand. Help us, God, to be open-minded tonight. I pray that you'd anoint me, that you just help me to be a teacher, one that will uh, penetrate hearts and lives. Let us be changed by your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Hey, leave your Bibles open because the, 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 the meat of this message is going to follow in chapter 12. So just keep everything flowing. The heart of the hypocrite. Wow, the word hypocrite. <laughs> oh boy, we could just kind of get deep right there in the beginning. We've heard it. If you're a Christian, you've been called it. It's excuses other hypocrites use for not coming to church. Uh, it's overused. It's misused. It's misunderstood. Tim Brister, in a blog post um, from The Place of Truth, uh, had a great de- definition of hypocrisy. Here's what he says. Hypocrisy is when someone's behavior does not match their beliefs. A person professes one thing while they practice something else. We, we, have, we have learned to use the word hypocrite in the church world to mean almost anything we want it to mean because we think, oh, this, this is a noodle that sticks to the wall, so let me just call them all a hypocrite and, and, and I can get mad because the hypocrites. And, and, but here's the thing, hypocrisy, true, the heart of hypocrisy grows with an absence uh, of conviction. The reason the heart of a hypocrite begins to grow and the heart of the hypocrite begins to flourish is because there's no conviction of the heart. We may see the fruit of behavior by the discipline of an outward motive, but we lack depth in our heart. A a person that has the heart of a hypocrite may have great ability to, to line up with the rules, great ability to cross the T's and dot the I's. They have all of the rules that they have learned to maintain and, and, and they, can be, they can be faithful even to church attendance and they can be faithful to laboring in the church. But what happens is their hearts are still separated from God. What happens, they look like a Christian on the inside, but they don't have him on the out, uh, I'm sorry, they look like a Christian on the outside, but they don't have Christ on the inside. On the inside, they're far away from Christ. I will just pause here to say, make sure, 
I, I don't throw that world around lightly. I don't want you calling everybody you know a hypocrite. All right? Hypocrites can pretend. They can uh, pose. They can present themselves as religious. But down deep, they're not driven by conviction because a child of God is driven by conviction. Conviction of the word. We are led by conviction. And we're led away from things by conviction. The reason a godly man will not do the same things as an ungodly man. Listen, there may, we may all face the same temptations, godly and ungodly. But my convictions steer me away from that temptation. And then what happens in my life is, if I know whatever, let's just... Let, I don't even know. You just pick a topic. Whatever that temptation is in your life, um, let's just say it's smoking, all right? I, I want it because y'all know I've, I've told you about me uh, in my younger years uh, craving cigarettes and smelling tobaccos and wanting a cigar. And, and if I was going to smoke, I'd be a cigar smoker. And I wouldn't smoke all the time, just occasionally. But in the church of God, we believe no smoking at all. So anyway, but so, so in order for it, wouldn't it be foolish for me if that's a temptation, see, conviction says I'm part of a denomination that is against smoking 100%. We don't, we don't believe in smoking a cigar when ten, Alabama beats Tennessee because that is tradition. So we don't do that because I have a conviction not to do that. So, but watch this. Knowing that I'm convicted, I've often said, boy, if I had a cigar on this beach patio, I'd just smoke a cigar right here watching the waves flow in. I'd just puff away. So what I do is, because conviction says, I ain't going to go buy no cigar. Right. I face the temptation, but I ain't going to go to buy a cigar. Because conviction now, watch this, conviction takes me down a different avenue. If Avenue A has my, my temptations that I'm going to fall prey to, so what do I do? I avoid that section of town, and I, my conviction says, oh, you got to go a different direction. Why well, put myself in that position? So a hippo, the heart of a hypocrite has no conviction. Oh, as long as we can look in front of our church people, but my life has to be driven by conviction. That's why there's a place in the New Testament where you're driven by the wind. And, and you fall to every temptation and, and your wells that are whitewashed, but you have no water. Why? Because you have no conviction. You have no anchor to your soul. Now listen, a person with a real sincere heart chasing after God is going to fall down. That does not mean you're a hypocrite. So I want you to hear me tonight in this message. I'm not calling anybody in this room a hypocrite. You'll see that at the end. Because I, I don't want people to take me wrong. So I want to make sure just children of God fall down sometimes. I may get to a weak point and like a friend of mine find a half-smoked cigarette on the ground and go, I'm smoking the rest of it. I would hope I wouldn't do that. But I did have a friend that did that one time. All right? So it, it is, I don't want, I don't, and, and I also want you to think about this. Let's say I see somebody else fall down. Let's say Danny falls down. Danny has a bad week and does some things uncharacteristic to save Danny. What if she goes back to a little bit of her old lifestyle? For That doesn't mean she's a hypocrite. Right. It means she, had, she fell down. And it's the church's job to pick her up and to restore her and to get her back to a healthy state. But what a lot of times we do is, oh, that's a hypocrite. Did you, did you see how Pastor Chris responded? Did you see him in that tobacco store standing there smelling every pack he could smell? That hypocrite. No, no, no. I'm in a weak moment. So the thing to do is say, hey, Brother Chris, what you standing at that? Why, are you, why is your nose punched against that glass? Come on outside and get some fresh air. Right? Put your arm around Danny saying, girl, calm down. Your old, the old Danny's coming out. <laughs> All right? Because I don't want you to think every mistake makes you a hypocrite. It does not. Now, in our text, I read to you a bunch of verses. I'm going to read a bunch more verses tonight. Because in our text, Jesus gives a few woes to the Pharisees. Woe to those Pharisees who clean the outside of the dish while the inside is still dirty. Because see, in the Pharisees' mind, it was all about ceremonial stuff. It was all about the pomp and the circumstance. It was all about the, the length of the robe, the height of the hat. It was all about, uh, oh, i got to do this a certain way. And it was, but they, the, the, what really mattered was not the outside of the dish, but the nastiness of the inside of the dish. 
You, you, it's so easy for Christians, and listen, and this is going to hurt all of us, it's so easy for Pentecostal Christians especially to go through some ceremonial Holy Ghost Church of God stuff and not cleanse the inside of our dish. Because the inside demands holiness. And, without, and what happens is we learn to go through the emotions of Pentecost, and I'm going to use the words, the emotions of Pentecost on the outside while we ignore the holiness or the lack thereof on the inside. The Pharisees' activate, uh, activities were ways to make themselves look better. They wanted to be in the place of prestige, the place of honor. They wanted to have the greatest titles and the greatest greetings. They wanted people to, to see them as who they were. It's like I won't ever forget uh, a pastor that I served under one time who I, oh, I bless his heart and, and her heart. They, they were great people, and I love them both. Even today, I love them both. But she would correct people. He was only in his 30s, and if somebody like Sister Wanda called him by his name instead of pastor his name, she would veer real rough, correct. You don't call him that. You call him pastor, blah, blah, blah. I was like, and then I'd have to go behind trying to, hey, don't, don't, don't leave. Don't, don't get mad. You know, because some people think it's so much about how you are addressed. You can call me Pastor Chris and still make me feel like a dog. You know what I mean? And you can call me Chris and make me feel like a king. So the Pharisees were all about titles, all about trying to make sure they were called the right way. But what happened was none of that brought any glory to God. It only brought, brought glory to themselves. The heart of the hypocrite shines lights on your, themselves instead of on the glory of God. Amen? Amen. The heart of the hypocrite always wants to make some themselves look better while making somebody else look less because how dare we be equal how dare we tap into each other's gift how dare me honor Amanda for her gift because then it may make my gift look less so what I do is I put her gift down while I exalt my gift but the way the gifts work is we link them together and all of that becomes more powerful so when a church full of hearts of hypocrites, before long we are diminishing each other and the church, the purpose of the church is to all work in unity together. The church is most best, and that's a double negative, we are at our best when we are in unity and every part of the body is functioning as it is supposed to. But the heart of the hypocrite diminishes somebody else in order to promote themselves. The heart of the hypocrite. But I read to you about unmarked graves. They were a menace to the Pharisees. Because if you, if you walked over a grave, you were now unclean for the day. So they tombstones that we have today uh, that lie in our graveyards, they were, they were started way back then. They would whitewash stones so they would mark the grave so that they would know to go around the grave and not walk over the grave. Because they didn't want to be ceremonially unclear, unclean. And these graves uh, would be markers. And what would happen is these religious people would have all this outward display, but then they were really concealing the deadness of their heart. Oh, oh they would act like they were alive and holy and pompous, and they would, let me just put it in ways we can, we can say. We'll make sure we mark certain sins that we don't do. We won't mark the sins we do, but we'll mark the sins somebody else does. And we'll whitewash and avoid the sins. But now, if I'm a gossip, I don't, run, I don't talk about myself because I'm just spreading. I'm just trying to get prayer requests done. Now, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to talk to somebody about how to help somebody else about all their sin in their life. So I, 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 mark, I don't mark my stuff. Right, right. And what happens is the heart of the hypocrite always starts with a dead heart because I should be convicted of all sins, not just somebody else's. As a matter of fact, let me get that two by four out of my eye before I worry about the speck in somebody else's eye. Amen. 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 Oh, listen to this one. And this is where it talked about the laws and the, the scribes. They were, they were scribing the law Hypocrites, the heart of the hypocrite often interprets the word in a way to fit their lives while it destroys others. 
they put legalistic requirements on others, but they find them ways themselves to avoid it. They'll do anything they can to avoid the law that they have imposed. You remember when Joshua took the promised land, they began to, he fought Jericho, and there was like, I think there was like, is it 31 kings? They just, he destroyed just one after another. I mean, battle after battle. Now, he had one setback because they didn't, they didn't well, they messed up. So, but they fight 31 kings later. And remember what the rule was, you destroy everything, destroy all their gods. God, and he kept on telling, you, you only worship me, you only worship me. God was not concerned, and you're going to hear this probably in a sermon later. God was not concerned with them forsaking him. He was more concerned with them mixing those other gods with him. Blending those popular Asherah gods and all these other gods and mixing their, that, those re- traditions into his tradition. And he is but one. In America, we, we deal with the god of mammoth, the, the, the little god of money. And what we do now, the church has so mixed the world into our church. It, it, how did Jim Simbola say it? We're having reverse evangelism. Reverse evangelism. The world is now changing the church instead of the church changing the world. Because we have mixed so much of culture in the church, we now have no ability or power to change the world because we're becoming just like them. And you cannot change someone you're just alike. The heart of the hypocrite loves to be able to interpret the word to be able to make themselves stronger while making somebody else weaker. Let me get to the meat of this. I could keep on giving you bullet points, but I want to give you four examples of hypocrisy. Let me check the time. I'm good. I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, Look over at chapter 12. Jesus talks about the hypocrite. But I want to give you four examples of hypocrisy that Jesus talked about. Look at chapter 12, verse number 4. I'm going to read verse 4 through 7. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him. Notice him is capitalized. Fear God, who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Jesus exposes the fear of man. The heart of the hypocrite is afraid. The heart of the hypocrite is afraid. You're afraid of everything, of everybody. Jesus says, quit being afraid of every man. They may kill you, but they cannot touch your soul. And we are, we become so afraid. I was speaking to someone today and and, and he gave me a list of things that he says that made him feel terrible. And I said, but isn't the root of all that pride? Isn't everything that you just told me linked to a seed of pride in your life that you need to destroy and then not worry about what anybody else says? And a lot of things in our lives that are controlling Christians comes from the heart of a hypocrite because we're so afraid of being dismissed, or let me use it in a woke term, being canceled. We're so afraid of being run down. We're so afraid of what people may say about us. Men may kill us, but they have no authority over who I am in Christ. We may come to a place in, they may kick me out of my job, kick me out of my position, but they cannot kick me out of the authority that I have in Jesus Christ because there's something inside of me that's greater than a dead heart. The heart of the hypocrite is always afraid because he doesn't have a living heart that says, I am alive no matter what. Be careful not to live as if you value safety and security of this world due to the fear of man. When the fear of man controls you, you have not realized how valued you are in God. When you're only concerned about what somebody else says, you are not concerned with what God says. 
And when fear leads you, when the heart of the hypocrite, the fear of the heart of the hypocrite leads you to fear. Oh, Summer's talking bad about me. Brother Richard's going to think bad about me. Now, you better worry about what God thinks about you. Worry about what God, and listen, and, and, and I don't want you to think about that in a negative way. I want you to think about what God has already declared over your life. Because what happens is the heart of the hypocrite is going to always look through negative lens. But when I look through the eyes of God, I see myself as an overcomer and a conqueror. I see myself as powerful. I see myself as a man of, of anointing that breaks yokes of bondage. I see my man with the ability to cast out devils, lay hands on the sick. I, I, you see what I'm saying? So a, a living heart begins to see that you're valued, more valuable than all the sparrows. The contradiction of behavior that we have when fear attract, uh, attaches to us indicates the absence of God as your anchored treasure. Anchored treasure. When I have a contradiction in my life, now listen, we're going to go through stuff that's going to cause us to go, <gasps> you're going to go to the doctor and they, they say the C word, <gasps> But watch what happens. So I, I, I don't want you to, I'm a hypocrite because I, the doctor said I may have cancer. When Amy found out, when the doctor said, well, I, hopefully this ain't going to be cancer, and he threw it around so lightly, she and I sat in the car weeping over the fear of the possibility of having cancer. But watch what happened. That night, a circle of friends joined at our house, anointed Amy, prayed, and guess what we now have, then had? peace. Fear attached, but peace destroyed. Or let me say it like this. Fear attached, but, uh, but peace detached it from our life. So I don't want you going home going, well, Lord, Brother Chris said, I, I'm always afraid. I'm a hypocrite and didn't say that. I'm saying you have a heart. You have to be careful because a sign that your heart is dealing with a hypocritical heart is that you have a contradiction of what God is able to do in your life. Yeah, Number two, Jesus exposes shame and denial. Let's keep on reading verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 8. Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, also will confess him before the angels of God. But he who dis denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Verse 10, and anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, Jesus, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. And, and listen, we can, we, there are 650 di different people that have different ideas about what blasphemy is. All right? Uh, we can get into that later. Basically, the sim most simple definition is not cursing the Holy Ghost, but simply not believing in the Holy Ghost. Because if you don't believe in him, he'll never convict you of your sins. All right? But if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you shall not be forgiven. Verse 11. Now when they bring you to the synagogue and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. A Christian cannot make a profession of faith and loyalty to God in the house and then deny him at the supermarket. That's the heart of the hypocrite. The heart of the hypocrite is ashamed to be saved outside of church. And I'm going to go ahead and go a little step further. The heart of the hypocrite is ashamed to go to a Pentecostal church outside of Pentecostal church. Y'all know those people. Where do you go to church? Oh, I just go to that church and rise and fall. And, uh, oh, yeah, I, you know that. You know that church. That's church. What, what do they believe? Oh, they believe, you know, Jesus. Got to get saved through Jesus. I believe Jesus. But they'll deny speaking in tongues. They'll deny healing. They'll deny people shouting and getting drunk in the spirit. They'll deny all that stuff because they're ashamed of that activity of the spirit. That comes from the heart of the hypocrite. Amen. Don't be ashamed. Listen, and I, and I know why. One reason we're ashamed is we don't know how people will receive it. We don't know if they're going to now combat us. If they go to a different church. And one reason we're ashamed or afraid they're going to combat us because we don't know how to come back at them. Because we have learned how to speak in tongues without having a revelation and an understanding of what the gifts are. So what we do is we operate in a gift we can't fully understand or yet how know how to explain. If you're going to operate in a gift, you need to ask God to give you the revelation knowledge to be able to explain what you're operating in. 
You cannot operate in the gift of tongues effectively if you can't explain it. I could not explain the gift of tongues until I spoke with them. But now I can explain this prayer language. I can explain the difference of a prophetic word of tongue in, in, in a service compared to a prayer language. I can, I can walk somebody through a long discourse of all the gifts of the Spirit. Because watch what happens. Oh, Jesus, help me. A, a Pentecostal church becomes very shallow when they operate in gifts they don't understand. A Pentecostal church that operates in gifts they don't understand abuse the gifts, get the gifts out of order in a service, speak things in their lives they should withhold and withhold things they ought to speak because they don't have the knowledge that should come with the word. Y'all just got a lesson, right? Y'all just got a, a heavy lesson right there. Thank you, God, for letting me get off my notes. The heart of the hypocrite will fail with shame and denial because if you deny Christ, he'll deny you. The one who has Jesus as Lord, when you realize the price of Calvary, when you realize what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you don't care who knows it and you don't care who, you don't, you don't care. Let them talk back because you have such a, you realize you are on your way to hell and out of grace and mercy, he forgives you of all of your sins and you don't really care what anybody, because you have, a, a, you have received the forgiveness, you don't make, listen, grace is one of those things you really can't explain. I can give you a Sunday lesson on grace, but to understand how God loved me when I was horrible and he forgave me just by me coming to him and my messed up, how he picks me up over and over again after I've messed up. Oh, it's hard to, because we can't, you know why we can't comprehend grace? Because we get to the point where we say we're done with them. Right? Amanda's only going to walk over me so many times before I move out the way. Right? But God just keeps on picking us up. Keeps on forgiving us. Thank, oh, thank you, God. Everybody ought to go, thank you, God, because you know I have messed up too many times in my life. <laughs> so Jesus exposes shame and denial. A heart that is alive, will God will provide boldness. He'll provide knowledge and answers. The Holy Ghost gives you what you need when you need it. Oh, my goodness, I just realized I have another page I thought I, was, I thought I only had four pages, and I just saw page five lurking right over here. I got to hurry. Number three, a life consumed with covetousness. Uh-oh. Let's look at, by the way, these are Jesus' words, not mine, so y'all take it up to him. Verse 13 says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell me, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said to him, man who, made me a man who made me a judge or an arbiter over you. And he said to them, take heed and be aware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. One's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And then he spoke a parable saying the, uh, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I'll do this. I'm going to pull down my barns. I'm going to build greater barns. And I'll, have, I'll store all my crops and all my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, you fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then those things, uh, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and not rich toward God. A life consumed with covetousness. Too often we prioritize, we pursue, we plan a life that the world determines our worth. And we only feel like we're worthy by a certain lifestyle we have in America. And if I don't get to a certain lifestyle or a certain home or a certain neighborhood or a certain car, then I'm not worth. Your worth is not determined by your money. A hypocrite believes there's eternity to gain. Oh, I got eternity to gain. But they spend their whole life contradicting the reality that heaven is real. 
because they will do everything they can to make worldly things their heaven. Oh, I, 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 I can't sacrifice. I'll sacrifice everything to have more worldly stuff, but I can't sacrifice an hour on Sunday mornings for Jesus. The heart of the hypocrite. And what happens is we lay all these treasures around us from a heart of covetousness. Listen, this is what Jesus said. And, and we think all about the inheritances that are going to make us rich. Would you rather have the inheritance of a rich man on the earth or the inheritance of a godly man? Because I have to get to the point that I realize, Liz, listen, it ain't wrong to drive Cadillacs. Thank you, Carrie Beth. It ain't wrong to have a nice house for all of you who live in mansions. The thing is, is when I begin to link my worth to those things, when I link my value based on the value of my car, (laughs) if you got to drive up in a run-down, beepity-glanking old thing, drive up and come in and get your worship on, and you'll be just as anointed as the person that drives up in a brand-new Cadillac. doesn't matter. And and, and listen, and this is a Western thing, an industrialized society's mentality. Because people that ain't got nothing in Ethiopia or people that ain't got nothing in in Haiti, they don't deal with this same type. Now, they deal with it in a different manner than we deal with it. But in America, we have made wealth our God. We We do everything we can to serve this thing. And we build bigger and greater barns to outdo everybody else's barn. And we work ourselves to death to fill our barns while we never do anything to build the kingdom of God. It is so much more important to build God's kingdom than it is our barns. And I'm not against you saving for a rainy day. Save for a rainy week if you want to. I'm not against that. But what I'm against is when the kingdom goes without, why you have more than enough. It's the heart of the hypocrite. The heart of the hypocrite is never satisfied. Watch this, because our value system is based on the wrong merits. The heart of the hypocrite is never satisfied. Have you ever realized in your life, and maybe this is just the way I have... If I have $1,000, I can live on $1,000 until I get 2000 When I get 2000 I may need 2000 to live until I get 3000 When I get 3000 I can't live on 2000 no more because now I've adjusted my lifestyle to live on 3000 know Anybody else done that? Anybody else when you were young and dumb, my first raise as a teacher, y'all know what I went? I, I had like $234 raise a month. Y'all know what I did? Went and bought a car for $234 a month. Wasn't that the dumbest thing ever? Okay, I digressed. Don't be young and dumb. Most of us are old and, and feeble. But old and wise is what I meant to say. Ain't none of us feeble, praise God. Old and wise. So make sure you are not l- basing your value on the wrong merits. And the last but not least is I have to hurry. A life of worry and anxiety. And some of us are going to feel convicted here. But stay with me. Verse 22 through 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, about the body, what you'll put on it. Life is so much more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, which have, uh, and they neither have storehouses or barns. God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than those birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to your stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? I'm going to stop there because it goes on but because of time. Listen, all of us have the basic need of food. The the days of nakedness is over. Well, some people are trying to bring it back, but most of us walk around with clothes. All right? Since Adam and Eve hid themselves with fig leaves. All right? It's it's a basic need. Food. I'm going to go somewhere tonight and eat. All right? Jackson's already had his McDonald's. I saw him eating all the outer parts of the nuggets. (laughs) Right over there. Carrie Best's going to eat the insides after church. 
So I know that's kind of gross to think about, but that is what she does. No need to. He, he eats half the nugget. She eats the other half. So it works out. Now listen. So I don't want you to think that you don't. Listen, God's going to provide for you. And one of the things you learn about growing in faith, and I don't have time to go this way, is that you have to learn to trust God with the basics of your life. Quit worrying about, God is going to meet your need. I, I just read where uh, Jim Cimbala, I just got finished, I, I, I mentioned his book last week. I just finished um, Fan the Flame. It's really a book written toward leaders, written toward pastors, actually. And he, he gave a testimony that they had, were, were doing a remodel on their latest sanctuary, uh, about 4,000 seat auditorium, and they bought an old theater in Brooklyn and were remodeling it and got a call from the guy saying, oh, listen, we misfigured. You're $6 million short. And he said, uh, I don't have $6 million. You told me this was going to be the price, and we've, got the, we've borrowed the money. He, says, I'm, he said, if you're going to go on with the project, you need $6 million. He said, I don't have, we, we're an inner city church. We don't have, we don't have $6 million laying around. <clears throat> and he said he, he, he had to leave to go on a mission trip to Angola somewhere, and he was worried. He was trying to preach to those poor people while trying to figure out where his $6 million was going to come from. He fed some hungry people while going, I got $6 million I got to deal with when I get home. What am I going to do? And he said, one day I just walked out. He said, I was so worried, couldn't sleep, walked down a long dirt road and just started crying, uncontrollably crying, going, God, I've got to have $6 million when I get back to America. We don't have, what, God, did you not tell me to build, sounds like Chris, God, did you not tell me to build this church debt free? God, did you not tell me to, you was going to provide? God, I don't know what's going to happen. And he said, the Lord's just, peace just fell on him, just peace. Now watch, the heart of the hypocrite started him to worry. But then the peace of God came in and said, haven't I always, haven't I always showed up in your life? Just relax. Everything's going to be taken care of when you get back home. And he said instantly, peace. The heart of the hypocrite said, worry, 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 worry. And the peace of God said, I got it. He said he gets back home. There's mail piled up all on his desk. He's, he'd been on the trip for 10 days. He starts going through. And he said about 10 minutes in of reading letters, opening stuff, he finds a check for a million dollars. It said, the Lord just laid this on my heart to give you a million dollars. He said he'd only met the man one time. He, he, he's opening up again. And he opens up an envelope from a man he has never met. Up to that time, he, this book was just released in 2021, or I mean, maybe early 2022. And uh, he says, I still have never met this man. And there was um, a check for six million, I mean, five million dollars. So two people, one man gave five million, one man gave a million without him calling anybody to ask for a donation. Wow. Without him telling his church, he hadn't even told them, hey, we're, we're six million dollars. He, he left to get on a plane, talk to his staff to about it. But because he had the heart of trust instead of the heart of... Now listen, I've opened up a lot of mail looking for checks. All right? I used to wait by the phone thinking Ed McMahon was going to call me anytime telling me I had won. Because I, I prayed over it and I anointed it. And I sent in the stamps with anointing oil on it. So I knew I was going to win. I waited. But what happens is in your life you learn to stop worrying. Because worry is not from God. Because God is the one that ministers to you. The heart of the hypocrite has no concern of God's compassion or God's provision for children. The heart of the hypocrite has no trust in the word and his promise to provide. The heart of the hypocrites, oh, this is hard, and I'm almost done. The heart of the hypocrite cannot seek the kingdom of God because the king is not ruling their hearts. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. The heart of the hypocrite cannot seek the kingdom of God first because the king is not in their heart. They operate, instead of, of running to the king and seeking the kingdom, they worry and they fret and they stress and they have anxiety because they don't have the faith and the trust they need. Now listen, and I, I'm closing. Listen, 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 listen. I'm not calling people who have worry hypocrites. We've all had worry. I'm talking about when you, the heart of the hypocrite just never releases that worry into the hands of God. Here's the difference between a Christ, the heart of a Christian and the heart of the hypocrite. The heart of the Christian and the heart of the hypocrite, Christians realize sooner or later God has provided for it all. I don't have to fear. I don't have to have shame. I don't have to have covetousness. I don't have to deal with anxiety and worry. I, I will deal with all of those things, but sooner or later I get to the point point, I go, God, you, 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 you're the master of it all. 
I don't have to worry about this because I don't have to worry about how I'm going to pay my bills. God, you're the master of it all. You're the master of it all. At the core of the heart, do you trust in a worldly system or the kingdom system? Where is your trust? What is the heart that you're operating out of? Do you follow the rules and the principles of the world and society and culture, or do you follow the principles of God and the teachings of the Word? Here's what I'm going to probably say. At times, I do both. I mean, let's not be so religious. We don't act like we don't all struggle. It's amazing how the heart is so complex. One segment of my life, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. The other side, I'm about to backslide. <laughs> Anybody else know what I'm talking about? I've got one thing under control, boy. Shouting victory, and then I can turn the corner in another part of my house, in my living room, in my, in my mind, in my spirit, in my soul, and go, ooh, i got a lot of work over in this part of the room. Sooner or later, all things merge back to the kingdom, though. You better stand, because Belle's home from college, and I'm three minutes late. And she's probably hungry, because she's driven from Stark, Vegas today. <laughs> <laughs> 